in our study in Nehemiah, and we came to Nehemiah 8, where that uh, very famous Bible conference in 445 BC in Jerusalem, and they studied the Bible all day, and it talked about Ezra um, reading the scripture, and Ezra and the priests explaining the scripture, and the point to be taken from that is the people went home, and they were joyful because they understood the scripture. They understood the scripture, and that's part of, well, that's what exposition is, um, bring out the interpretation so that we understand the scripture. And that's when uh, the question was raised, well, can we have a, uh, a focus on uh, interpretation? So we came into this, what we call a little theology break from our exposition and focus on what, what are some of the guidelines for interpreting the scripture and uh, what's involved in interpreting the scripture? So um, let me bring this up here. Uh, we have jumped into this little series on a simple introduction to interpreting the Bible and uh, had four parts to it, uh, from words to whole books. That's where most of the focus is on interpreting scripture because you come to a verse and you want to know what does this mean? Or to uh, maybe a paragraph, what does this mean? So you're interpreting the words, you're interpreting from the grammar, you're you're, you're studying it in its context, in the paragraph, in the book, and so on. But then there are other levels here. We talk about canonical level. That's because the scripture, um, the Bible, 66 books here in the Bible, but there is discernibly a narrative running through the whole canon. And so when you're interpreting any part, you want to put it in that canonical narrative. And then uh, that led to the issue of, well, where are we in that? So we're at a certain point in that canonical narrative. And from that point, we can interpret backward and we can look forward. The interesting thing is when you're reading the Bible, you're not like any other book reading the narrative ending. The end of the story is still in the future but it's projected by prophecy, by promise and prophecy. You're, you're told what the plan of God is. You see the direction of God's action. And so um, you're directed toward where that, but we're not at the end yet. We have, it, hasn't, it hasn't come yet. But understanding the end is important to understanding the story, isn't it? So the question is, where, where does it end affects how you understand the whole of this story. Well, that uh, then led us here to guidelines for interpreting prophecy. We talked about that last week. And that was uh, supposedly the end of our simple introduction, but I have a PS. Yep, there we are. Thank you. Okay, so we've got, there we are. See, January 7, postscript, supersessionism, non-supersessionist readings. That's where we are. All right. So <clears throat> two alternatives for reading the story of the Bible, supersessionist, non-supersessionist. What are we talking about? Why do we use these long words? <laughs> the word supersession comes from the word, from the verb to supersede, which means to replace. So supersessionism is sometimes called replacement theology. And what is it? Supersessionism is the theological view that the Israel of the Old Testament portion of the story has been set aside and replaced by someone or something else in the New Testament continuation of the narrative. And that at the end, in the consummation of the story of the Bible, it's the replacement entity, not Israel, 
that experiences the fulfillment of the promises that were given to Israel and the prophecies concerning Israel. Who is the replacement entity? Some have said it's Christ himself, just by himself. And some have said it's the church. And some have said it's Gentiles who have replaced Jews. So um, any of those are seen as replacement entities in the story of the Bible, and that's called a supersessionist reading. Now, here is where you come into that distinction between literal and spiritual interpretation. You've heard that before. Spiritual interpretation or spiritual reading of the Old Testament was used in order to shift the narrative from Israel to the replacement entity, from Israel to the church, or from Israel to the Gentiles, or Israel to Jesus by himself, personally. Okay. And um, so in order to do that, then one had, a, had to uh, have a different hermeneutic, a different interpretation. Uh, so when you're reading the Old Testament, you have to do something interpretively to change its meaning in order to get it there. So that was called spiritual interpretation. And uh, non-supersessionism is simply a denial of supersessionism. It's just not true. Israel is not replaced in the canonical narrative. You have promises and prophecies concerning Israel in the Old Testament. They will be fulfilled by the time you get to the end, the consummation. Consequently, su uh, non-supersessionism affirms a literal reading of God's covenant promises and prophecies to Israel. Uh, this allows, of course, for the normal use of language, the metaphors and other forms of figurative language, that's normal speech, and that's not ruled out by literal interpretation. Literal just simply means that the promises and prophecies concerning Israel will be fulfilled for Israel um, in the consummation of the biblical story. Now, <clears throat> if I were going to do this as thoroughly as I would like to, I would spend the rest of today on Roman numeral two, <laughs> which would be basic reasons for a non-supersessionist reading of scripture. But I don't feel I need to do that because we have uh, addressed this in various ways through, the, through our class. Let me just summarize them for you. First of all, basic reason for not reading it in a supersessionist manner is the integrity of God and his word of promise. God made promises to Israel. And I like to refer to what I call ENT Israel. That's ethnic, national, and territorial. God made promises to this people regarding them being a nation with respect to a land. And the integrity of God who made the promise is on the line here. And, uh, and his word, as we know, is true. And so consequently, that in itself is a reason for not reading this in a supersessionist manner. The second is that the reason people do this is they there is this idea out there, this assumption, <clears throat> that when you're in the Old Testament, well, that has to do with Israel. But when you're in the New Testament, that has to do with the church. Uh, or let's say when we move to the New Testament, we're now bringing the Gentiles in. So Old Testament is Israel, but the Gentiles come in the New Testament. But this simply is not true. The blessing of Gentiles is actually a literal feature of Old Testament promise, going all the way back to Abraham. I will bless you and make you a great nation, he says to Abraham regarding Israel. And in you, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. There's the wide universal blessing back in Genesis. And this gets repeated throughout the Old Testament portion of the narrative. So you don't need to supersede Israel in order to get there to bless the Gentiles. Third point, 
God's plan for Israel is specifically reaffirmed in the New Testament. The New Testament says this. Uh, key passage is one that we spent a lot of time on here in our study in Romans. It's Romans 9, 10, and 11, culminating in Romans 11, where Paul asked the question whether um, God has rejected his people. He said, absolutely not. And he talks about the, the salvation of all Israel uh, after the fullness of the Gentiles comes in and, uh, and all of this. So this plan for Israel is specifically reaffirmed. Now, here's the point going forward here. There is no specific teaching of supersessionism in the New Testament. There is no direct statement that Israel has been superseded in the plan of God. There just it isn't there. But there is direct affirmation of God's plan to bless Israel along with Gentiles in the consummation of the plan. So when we go forward then, looking at um, supersessionist, the reason for a supersessionist reading, I like to think of this as a lot of uh, hints, winks, and nods that people think they're seeing in the New Testament. And uh, But what I want to do is I want to show you what it is, the, the passages of Scripture in the New Testament, that people appeal to when they argue for a supersessionist reading. And I want to give you a non-supersessionist response. Now, all of this is going to move really quickly. So this is the part where I say, you know, if it's not clear to you, just put a little asterisk on your uh, notes so that, you know, if you want to go back and talk about it, we can do that. But we're going to, we're taking off now on our supersonic flight. And I'm asking you to look at the terrain as we pass over it. Okay. <clears throat> So here we go. There's basically uh, four sections. I've grouped these passages of scripture in four sections. Uh, the first is um, passages that uh, people believe are evidence that the Old Testament should be spiritually interpreted. That is interpreted in a supersession story. The second is a lot of passages of scripture that supplying the imagery related to Israel to Jesus or to the church. Okay. The third uh, is a Pauline passage that is appealed to, to say that Paul was expanding the covenant promise. So God made a promise to Israel. Then Paul expands it to be, you know, uh, everybody. And then the last two here are, is a group of passages from the Gospel of John, and then uh, some passages in Hebrews. Okay, so here we are. We're about to take off uh, right now. So <clears throat> the first group is some passages that are appealed to to say uh, this is teaching that when you go to the new to the old testament and you read about israel you should spiritualize that you should interpret that spiritually okay the first passage here is second corinthians 3 6 uh where paul says we are ministers of a new covenant not of the letter but of the spirit this passage was highlighted uh in the early third century uh a.d in a textbook on interpreting the Bible as the key. And it's from this passage that the word literal and spiritual have been used in Christian tradition, okay? We're not of the letter, we're of the spirit. And that's assumed to mean that we interpret spiritually, not literally. But actually what um, Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians 3 is he's, talking about the fact that he and the other apostles are ministers of the new covenant. Now, the new covenant was the covenant prophesied by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31, verse 31, where he said, uh, the days are coming when the Lord is going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and it won't be like the old covenant. In this covenant, I'm going to write my law on their hearts. 
Instead of writing it on stone, I'm going to write it on their hearts. Then Ezekiel expands on that by saying, God says he's going to put his spirit in them and cause them to walk in his ways. So Paul is saying we're ministers of the, of the new covenant, not of the letter, as meaning the letters that were written down on stone. But we're of the covenant in which God writes it directly on your heart. The covenant that Jeremiah predicted, this new covenant, reaffirmed the promises to Israel. You can read them in Jeremiah. A people, a nation, and a land. So this verse is not an excuse for spiritualizing the promises that were given to Israel. In fact, it doesn't contradict what Paul writes in Romans when he expects a future for Israel. Galatians 4, 21 to 31, this is where Paul takes the story of Hagar and Sarah out of Genesis, and he speaks of an allegory. He allegorizes it. And he uses the word allegory. So I'm going to tell you an allegory. He says, we're like the children of Sarah. Uh, and uh, the people who are opposing our gospel like the children of Hagar. And so he does this allegory. So then people say, well, see, Paul is showing you the way to interpret the Old Testament. You are to understand that it's all an allegory. And its real meaning is something else which they're going to suggest. But taking scripture and allegorizing it in your rhetoric, your rhetorical teaching and so on, is different from allegorical interpretation, which says the actual meaning is allegorical. Paul is, is using it as an allegory, but he does not deny the reality of Hagar and Sarah. And so... <clears throat> The point is that the literal meaning is not being denied uh, by Paul allegorizing it in his use. And it doesn't mean that the covenant, the patriarchal covenant given to Abraham, has been spiritualized, that it has lost its meaning. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the point is that these evidences of so-called spiritual interpretation are not contradicting the promises and plans of God for Israel. Now, we have a lot of passages here under this point, the application of Israelite imagery to Christ or the church by New Testament authors. So let me jump into this real quickly. We're talking about, they're talking about Christ or the church, and they're using this imagery. And the argument is that since they do that, wink, nod, and hint, uh, you're to understand that the promises to Israel have been all redirected and spiritualized. First one here is Matthew 2.15. So Matthew uses the language of Hosea 11.1. 1, Out of Egypt, I called my son. And he says that this was fulfilled by Jesus being taken in and being brought out of Egypt by Joseph and Mary. What you have is a type pattern of Israel coming out of the Exodus, and God says to Pharaoh, uh, let my son go. Israel is his son. So Hosea says he brought his son out of Egypt. So Matthew says when Jesus comes, you see, that's being fulfilled. You have a type pattern being fulfilled. But the type pattern does not logically mean that Israel has been superseded in the canonical narrative. There's no logical conclusion to that. The type pattern merely underscores the point that Jesus is God's son. That's what it's doing. Saying something about Jesus is not saying something about Israel in the canonical narrative. 1 Corinthians 10, 6. Paul draws a type connection between Israel's experience in the Exodus and New Testament Christians. So he says, well, these Israel was baptized. He uses the word baptized. They were baptized in the cloud and baptized in the sea. And then what happened? Well, God tested and disciplined them. What's Paul's point? 
uh, he will test and discipline us, even though we've been baptized into Christ. Now, by doing that, he's not denying Israel's role in the canonical narrative. It doesn't logically mean that Israel has been superseded. It's simply drawing a tight connection and applying the pattern. Very quickly, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Here is Peter using the language of Exodus 19.6. This is where God has Israel at Sinai, and he's making them into a nation. And Peter quotes the language that God gives to Moses. He says, you will be a chosen people, a royal nation, that is a kingdom of priests, um, a, a holy people. So Peter uses that language, and he applies that to the readers of his letter. Okay, so, and he also draws language out of Hosea 1 and 2, and this is a very interesting passage in Hosea. We'll see this again in a moment, where Hosea uh, uses this language, not my people and my people, because Israel has been living like the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are not my people. But since they've been living like that, God says, so you're going to be not my people, and I'm going to treat you like that. But then Hosea concludes where he brings not my people back to him, and now they're called my people again. So anyway, Peter uses all this language, and uh, the argument of supersession is, see, he's using that with respect to the church. <clears throat> the point is, that doesn't logically mean that Israel's place in the narrative has been superseded or replaced. Even if Peter is applying that language to Gentile Christians, uh, neither Peter nor any New Testament author explicitly says that Israel as an ethnic, national, territorial reality has been displaced from the inheritance God promised. The use of the language here doesn't logically require that, but it's more likely that what Peter is doing is he's speaking to Jewish Christians. And why is that? Galatians 2.7, Peter is called the apostle to the circumcision. Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. Peter, and so they had made an agreement that Peter would restrict his ministry to Jews and Paul would focus on Gentiles. So here, if that's so, if we look at the letter from that standpoint, it's more likely that Peter is writing to Jewish Christians. The very first verse of his epistle says, to the exiles that are scattered all over this place. Gentiles are not exiles. The exiles are Jewish exiles who are scattered through this region. And he's writing to them. And to these Jewish Christians, Peter would be saying, you know, this was said about Israel, but you are the Israel in whom that is especially being seen. You're fulfilling that promise that was given to Israel because you are connected to Christ. Well, 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, this is where he goes on to talk about these believers being built into a spiritual house that is a temple. And I'll refer to numbers seven and eight down the line here because I'll come back to this in some other passages of scripture. Let's go to Galatians 6, 16. That's number five on your list. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule and to the Israel of God. Supersessionists say, see that Israel of God? He's talking about the church there. He says, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule and, see that and there? And means equal sign. Equal sign is the Israel of God. All who follow this rule, what's the rule? The previous verses say the rule is it's neither circumcision or some non-circumcision that counts. What counts is a new creation. So Paul says, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. Well, who follows that rule? Well, all Christians, Jew and Gentile. So then they say, see, Paul is calling those people the Israel of God. That means the church has replaced Israel in the plan and purpose of God. But it's more likely that the and, the and is the Greek um, connective, the Greek conjunction chi, K-A-I, 
which um, can mean a simple connection, like we use the word and, but the chi can also indicate, we can translate this way, and especially. That is um, this, but then and especially that. And the and especially notes a portion of those within the group to whom this especially applies. He's talking about the rule that what counts is a new creation. So peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, that's to the whole church, but and and especially to the Israel of God. This is more likely the meaning and it is consistent grammatically, all right? Uh, lexically and grammatically. But uh, it's consistent with the Paul who writes in Romans 9 to 11 that God's plan for Israel remains and he will fulfill it. And in the end, all Israel will be saved when all the fullness of the Gentiles comes in and so on. So <clears throat> the suggestion here is that this is not a basis for supersessionism, but it's often cited. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 20 to 21, Peter says baptism uh, corresponds to the ark transference of Noah's family through the flood. But Peter doesn't deny the reality of the ark or the flood. Okay, The tight correspondence between the ark and baptism doesn't mean that Israel has been superseded in the narrative. That's another one of those hints, winks, and nods. Mm -hmm. It's number seven, 1 Corinthians. We're going fast here, but uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17 and 6, 19. Okay, here are the passages of scripture, that and the next one, number eight, Ephesians 2, 11 to 21, where Paul's talking about the temple, that we believers having the Holy Spirit indwelling us need to consider ourselves as the temple. We're the temple of the living God. And he's talking about us individually, and then in Ephesians 2, 11 to 21, we're talking about us corporately, okay? And that's also back up at number four, First Peter 2, 4, and 5, he's speaking corporately. <clears throat> we form a temple. So I say here, um, the, the expansion of God's dwelling presence to include the indwelling of the people was prophesied by Ezekiel. As part of the new covenant, he said, I will put my spirit in you. Now, Ezekiel also sees the existence of a temple building. And the point of the whole prophecy of Ezekiel is how God's dwelling presence left the temple before the destruction and then returns to a future temple. And this is the same Ezekiel who is prophesying that the Spirit of God is going to be in you, right? This is compatible. It's not incompatible. Likewise, Paul's identification of this extended temple reality doesn't necessarily mean that the building and uh, that the, it doesn't necessarily mean the exclusion of an eschatological temple in Jerusalem. In fact, Paul expects a temple in Jerusalem during the tribulation period. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, and 5, he talks about the man of lawlessness taking his seat there. So there's a temple there. On the other hand, John sees a vision of the new Jerusalem in which the city appears as the holy of holies. Thus, there doesn't need to be a separate temple building. The passage, uh, so... Um, Consequently, however the temple feature is finally fulfilled, there's nothing in the discussion that requires that Israel has been superseded in the canonical narrative. There's no logical conclusion to that point. In number eight in Ephesians, talking about the corporate nature of the, of the temple building in which you've got Jews and Gentiles together. The passage does not say that believing Gentiles are added to Israel. Uh, it says they have been made fellow members of Christ along with believing Jews. That's Paul's point. It does not say that Israel has been redefined to mean now a multi-ethnic body. 
The passage does not eliminate ethnic distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Uh, it eliminates ethnic hostility by inclusion within the redemption of Christ. So together, Gentiles and Jews in Christ are built into a holy temple for the indwelling of God. What is this? What it is, is a picture of the kingdom reality. And that you take from Ephesians 1, 21 to 23, where Christ is given authority over all. That's kingdom authority. And in his kingdom, which from the Old Testament on is always predicted to be multinational, it's Jews, it's Israel, and it's Gentiles. That kingdom is held together by being directly connected to Christ. All the elements of it are directly connected to him. And it coheres and is stable forever because it's pervaded by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And that's true with all of our personal distinctiveness. You are you and I am I, <laughs> okay? We're, we're different individuals. And that also includes collective differences among the humans who are brought in and redeemed in that kingdom. That's why Israel as a corporate collective, which is promised to be that, is there in that everlasting kingdom and along with Gentile collectives, all of which are redeemed peoples. So Ephesians is looking to that. It's not redefining Israel out of the story. Romans 9, 24 to 25. I always said that Romans 9 to 11, Paul reaffirms the future for Israel. But supersessionists have found these two verses, these three verses, <laughs> in here and say, no, these three verses indicates that he has changed the meaning of Israel. Well, what are these three verses? This is where he uses the prophecy out of Hosea, okay, to describe Gentiles. So he quotes Hosea, not my people will be my people. God's going to take not my people and make them my people. And Paul says, he said this not just about Jews, but about us Gentiles. Okay, so I write here. The supersessionist argument uh, that this indicates that Paul is redefining Israel completely ignores the context in which, in the context, Israel is used in the particular sense of that people. And the future for particular Israel is explicitly affirmed. This is the whole argument of this section. It is best not to see the use of this language of Hosea 1.10 and 2.23 it is best to see it as an irony. Uh, and you want to see that because Israel received this designation of being not my people because they were living like Gentiles. The Hosea prophecy carries a strong affirmation that God will save Israel as Israel and confirm his promises to them. But Paul at this particular place in the argument, uses, uses the passage and the language of the prophecy ironically. The not my people who become my people were in Hosea, Israel living like Gentiles to become a holy Israel. And the irony is that God actually takes Gentiles who never were his people and he makes them his people as part of his kingdom plan. And that, that's why in Romans 11, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in and all Israel is saved, you got both of them there. You've got the Gentiles that never were his people that become my peoples, which Zechariah prophesied in Zechariah 2. There will be many nations that will be my peoples. All right. And so they come in and the Israel that were living like not my people become my people and they're all coming together in this kingdom order. Okay. Need to take a breath. 
Okay, we're speeding right along here. Okay, here we go. So the third group of passages of the winks and nods come from a Pauline language that appears to indicate an expansion of the covenant promised in particular to universality. What are we talking about? We're talking about Romans 4.13, where Paul speaks of the promise to Abraham and to his seed that he would be heir of the world. The supersessionists argue that Paul has expanded the promise that was given to a particular nation regarding a particular land, and he expanded that to be all peoples and all lands, world. So you see, he changed the meaning. So Israel, they say, has been replaced or redefined by a universal reality of the church in the New Testament. However, the literal promise to Abraham carried a universal extent of blessing. In addition to the particulars, he said, I will bless you and make you a great nation, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So there's the universal aspect in the actual covenant language. In Genesis 17, God says that Abraham, that's where he changes his name, from Abram to Abraham. And the reason is, is that Abraham, not just Abram, but Abraham will be the father of many nations. That's in Genesis, Genesis 17. And the chapter goes on to say that in spite of him being the father of many nations, it's the Isaac descendants that will carry the specific particular covenant promises to Israel. The point being that the universal aspect of the covenant promises is already there. It's not a basis for redefining Israel or arguing that Israel has been superseded. Okay. Let me go on to the Gospel of John. So, Early on in Christian history, the Gospel of John was referred to by uh, commentators or ancient Christian commentators as the spiritual gospel. Because the Gospel of John emphasizes this, um, a, a lot of uh, spiritual aspects of uh, Jesus, and there's a lot of typology in the Gospel of John. Let's look at what we got. I, I've grouped the passages into three groups here. Number one, several passages taken together. This is what we've got. So in John 2, 19 to 21, Jesus says, uh, destroy this temple in three days, I'll rebuild it. And then John has to say, he was talking about his body. They say they, they thought he was talking about the building, but he was talking about his body. In John 6, Jesus said, he is the true bread from heaven. He just fed them bread. And he said, but, I'm, but the, I am the true bread from heaven. So they're looking for manna. Okay, he said, now you need to look to me. In John 15, Jesus said, I am the true vine. So in Isaiah 5, the vine is a metaphor for Israel. And he says, I am the true vine. So you have to look to me. In John 4 and in John 7, he spoke of living water. He will give living water. John 7, he says, I believe who believes in me out of his innermost being with full living water. And then John explains, now he was talking about the Holy Spirit. These passages indicate a rich typological structure in scripture that converges on Jesus. We have types and metaphors. Some are types coming out of Old Testament narratives. Some are metaphors that are being used. And all of this underscores the importance of who Jesus is. It's underscoring the identity of Jesus. Look, there's no denying that when you get to the New Testament, you have an advance in the narrative. God becomes incarnate okay, on the earth. The Holy Spirit is given to indwell people. The, there's the spiritual aspects of the narrative are underscored and highlighted. But the point is that there's nothing here that logically implies that Israel has been replaced or that the covenant promises to the nation have been redefined. Especially as 
we've already noted that the Old Testament itself expects these spiritual blessings to come to Israel as a particular people. John 4, 21 to 24, Jesus tells a Samaritan woman, the time is coming and now is when they will neither worship in Jerusalem nor on Mount Gerizim. That where the Samaritans worship, but that true worship will be in the spirit and in truth. So supersessionists argue that like the temple here, the distinctiveness of Israel has been spiritualized. But there's no passage in John that says that the distinctiveness of Israel has been spiritualized. In actual fact, the time did come when worship ceased on Mount Gerizim and it ceased in Jerusalem on, on the Temple Mount. And they're not worshiping on the Temple Mount now, except for Muslims, you know. So <clears throat> in actual fact, that happened, but nothing prevents some future manifestation of a corporate national and we might say international temple worship in Jerusalem, as long as we see that coordinating with the second part of Jesus' words, that true worship is in the spirit and in truth. Look, we believe that true worship is in the spirit and truth, do we not? But we still gather in a physical building, don't we? Is this contradictory? No. <laughs> All right. So John 18, 36, Jesus says to Pilate, my kingdom is not, the Greek preposition is ek. It's not ek this world. What does ek mean? Translated many times, my kingdom is not of this world. So supersessionists have traditionally translated ek as of, implying that the kingdom is not political or material as the Old Testament had prophesied it to be. So it's not of this world. It's not like kingdoms of this world. But it is better to translate ek as from. That's an actual meaning of ek, of or from or out of. Speaking of origination, it doesn't come from this world. He's talking to Pilate. And what he's telling Pilate is he doesn't need an army. He doesn't need a political process. He doesn't need to politically work a relationship with Caesar. He doesn't need to revolt with an army against Caesar because his kingdom is not of this world. His, ki his kingdom is originating out of heaven. But that doesn't mean his kingdom is only in heaven. Right? Because the whole narrative is talking about coming from heaven here. There's nothing Pilate can do about that. In fact, if you wanted to, he could go into a little exposition of Daniel too. You know, he told Nebuchadnezzar it's going to fall on the kingdom of the world like a rock. And then it's going to become a kingdom in the world. Okay. So there is nothing here that indicates that Israel's place in the narrative has been replaced. Okay. Are you hanging in there? Okay. Last part. <clears throat> Language in Hebrews that indicates the change of some Israelite features in the progress of the canonical narrative. So Hebrews 8 and 9 describes the tabernacle as a type, as a copy, as a shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. The writer says that Moses was shown a copy on the mountain and the tabernacle was to be constructed like that. And that is a type copy of what's in heaven. He goes on to speak of the old covenant. That's the Mosaic covenant as obsolete, growing old and ready to pass away because a new covenant uh, is coming and taking its place. He speaks of a change in the law that was made to establish the Melchizedekian priesthood of Christ in Hebrews 7 and the service of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary in Hebrews 7 and 8. He also speaks of the abolition of sacrifices and offerings and sin offerings in order to establish the sacrifice of Christ. This is Hebrews 10, verses 1 to 10. Supersessionists infer from this that the entire order 
set up by the Mosaic Covenant, including ethnic, national, territorial Israel itself, is to pass away and be replaced by a true order, which is either Christ personally himself or the church. However, this reads more into Hebrews than is warranted. None of this wider supersessionism, especially ethnic, national, territorial Israel being replaced, is taught in Hebrews. The New Covenant promise, which the writer quotes several verses from Jeremiah 31 in Hebrews 8, 8 through 12, he quotes the part where the new covenant is made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah as the recipients of this new covenant. And Jeremiah included in the new covenant a reaffirmation of the ethnic, national, territorial promises of Israel. So even though you've got some tight changes, you've got the introduction of Melchizedekian priesthood, you've got these new things in the narrative of the progression, you don't have the removal of Israel from the story. Hebrews 11, 11 to 16. It is claimed that this passage makes the land of promise a type of heaven. Which, when you add that to the above passages, uh, is the basis for the supersessionist claim that the land and the order based on that land is to be replaced in the narrative by heaven and a heavenly order. But Hebrews 11.10 says that when Abraham went to the land, that's the literal land, he was looking for a city that was to be built by God. And Hebrews 11, 16 says, God has prepared for them a city. Now, here's the point of contention. Hebrews 11, 16 also says that the patriarchs, not only Abraham, but Isaac and Jacob, were wandering around in that land looking for a patria. What is a patria? And Hebrews says that the patria is heavenly. So is that a heavenly land? or heavenly city. A lot of your translation says he was looking for a heavenly land. But the context is all about a city. He's looking for a city. He's not looking for a land. Okay. The context would suggest that one refer to the primary meaning of patria. What does patria mean? The first meaning, the primary lexical meaning is a hometown. And that's why in the context, it says that if 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 the one that he had left was the patri, he would have gone back there. That's Ur. But he's looking for what the verse itself says is a city that God's going to give him. <clears throat> it's important because Hebrews 13, at the end of the book of Hebrews, talks about a city that's coming here. <laughs> that is to the earth. It's coming from heaven. And Revelation 21, 2 shows the city coming from heaven to the new earth. Also, Hebrews 2, 5, at the beginning of the book of Hebrews, says all of this that we're talking about is about the world to come. Not heaven, but the world to come. Okay? That's the general theme of the argument of the book. In other words, Hebrews is not speaking of the supersession of an earthly Israel by a reality in heaven. He's talking about an eschatological fulfillment that's consistent with the rest of the scripture. That is the new creation in which uh, God will fulfill all his promises. Now, the third point is against a supersessionist reading of Hebrews, one has to note Hebrews 6, 13 to 20, which states that the promises made to Abraham are unchangeable. For two reasons. One, God doesn't lie. That's sufficient. But not only that, but he swore that he would do it. So there's a divine oath. This is an eschatological hope that Hebrews says is a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. It's established in the secure atonement of Jesus Christ. Supersessionist readings end up changing the meaning of the promise. Now, 
three or four weeks ago, we talked about performative language. Performative language and a promise is a performative act, is a performative language. An oath is performative language. A covenant is conformative, uh, performative language. And that kind of language puts an obligation on the speaker and say, I promise to do this for you. I am morally now to account for carrying through what I promised. Supersessionist readings change the meaning of the promise. Can you do that? No, you cannot do that uh, without impugning the integrity of God. So I say that they miss the true plot of the canonical narrative. They change the substance of biblical hope and they risk impugning the integrity of God. Amen. So all of this, what all this shows is, so there's two approaches to reading this canonical narrative, supersessionist and non-supersessionist. And I argued that the, the the whole thing depends what's happening in the New Testament. We got we got the Old Testament pretty clear on a literal level, but when they get to the New Testament, do they change it? Has it shifted? And some say, well, it has. And they appoint they point to all this kind of evidence that we've looked at. But none of this explicitly says that as a fact. In fact, I would argue all of these things are consistent with a non-supersessionist reading. Israel is still there in the story, and God is doing for Gentiles what he prophesied and promised that he would do. And there are new things that are happening here, and things are being clarified in terms of God becoming incarnate and the gift of the Holy Spirit and all of that. But none of that is factoring Israel out of the equation. Well, that's a quick, you're going to land the plane. Land the plane. And uh, we have a minute. Now, look, next week, this is what I want to do next week, is I want to just, I'm going to ask Doug to send out all of these handouts on this simple introduction to interpreting the Bible. It is simple, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> simple introduction to interpreting the Bible and so that you have all the handouts in front of you and then I want to just enter in a time of Q&A with you see where you want to go what you want to talk about on that uh, clarifying anything or or you know pursuing something further uh, just so that we have a time to discuss this all right but uh, we have about a minute or two and so yes Ken real quick you didn't mention so I may be wrong, but in Revelation, when <clears throat> in heaven, there's the 24 elders, and I've understood it to be, you know, the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles, but those are, those are all but one, two. So, I mean, to yeah. me, that just is reinforcement that Oh, it would be all Gentiles if the church has been replaced. Well, yes, and, and you would not see, as the book of Revelation goes on, the, the focus on Israel. Uh, so you got Revelation 7 with uh, representatives of the 12 tribes. You got even at the end with the city, and uh, you got the 12 tribes there on names on the city. And so um, Israel's place is, is reaffirmed even in that vision that John had. I'm not sure I'm going to Yeah, yeah, right. Barbara? But it seems to me that uh, all of Revelation has been allegorized by the Catholic Church and uh, even uh, Seventh-day Adventists and all the on because they, it ties into the sermon this morning uh, about uh, when, when he points out that the power comes from Christ, who gives us the Holy Spirit, and if we read the Bible without the Holy Spirit interpreting it, that's how they come up with all of this superceptionist business. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. We need the power. Then the Reagan wrote, said, that is why we haven't had any Bible. And he wrote in 1920, you know, but I think that's when he um, because, because we don't recognize, we can read the word and know the word, but we don't live in the word with the power mm -hmm. that was given. 
Well, I appreciate, uh, Barbara, your comment, which is, you know, actually kind of turns it on its head that reading it spiritually is reading it uh, in accordance with the working and the gifting of the Holy Spirit. And um, that gifting and working of the Holy Spirit is in line and in accord with the promises of God. And those promises include God's plan for Israel, and they include God's plan for Gentiles. And what we need to do is instead of trying to factor Israel out of the story, uh, we need to focus on walking with God by the Spirit. And, uh, and, and, uh, and all of that is pointed to the, the composition and the nature of the kingdom that he's putting together. So thank you. And uh, Karen? Israel still is waiting for their Messiah. Yeah. They are looking for that future that you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, we're basically right before 11, uh, Roman, uh, Romans 11, 26. And when the fullness of Gentiles comes in, all Israel will be saved. And that happens when Redeemer returns from Zion. So there's more to the story to be, to, to, to play out. But the direction, I sometimes... Sorry for the jargon, but I sometimes refer to these passages like plot vectors. They indicate the direction of the plot. Where is it going? Well, Romans 11 is a clear direction of where it's going. There's a Israel is there in that in that story. Mark, the Jews don't recognize he came two thousand years ago. Yes, yeah, that's right. So the the Messiah who's coming is the one who came. And and so Paul says there's always a remnant, you know, to, to that effect, and, and it's growing. You know, when Doug sent this out last week, and I read it, it reopened a lot of wounds mm -hmm. from my, before I came to Christ. And, and, and I'll, I'll be a little bit probably unfair to the Catholic Church, but I also think that as a Jew, you know, a lot of Jews really have a lot of antipathy toward, toward Catholicism anyway. Mm -hmm. But when I made the conversion to Christ and the church, it, it really came home to me more and more as I, and you've added so much to my understanding on this, so I thank you for that. But it's, to me, it, it's, it seems like, and I'd love to hear you talk about this if you can add it next week, but to this early separation that the Rome did everything it could possibly do to, uh, trans, I guess, to, to move the focus from Israel to Rome. And I've oftentimes thought, as, as I studied this, that it's it's a, a deliberate attempt on the part of Rome to continue in its practice of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel. Mm -hmm. And even up until this day, the Pope, some of his most recent statements about the war over there, he you know, lends itself to reasons for this antipathy between Catholicism and Judaism because uh, in Christianity because they continue to demonstrate not only in, in the present time but if you look at the history of the, of the church you know their first concordance Hitler's first concordance with with any nation was with Rome and his second was with Italy mm -hmm. so I don't know how and I'd love to be far more uh, educated than I am on this, but is that still alive today? Is there still just such a division between the two faiths that you can't excuse the thoughts of it? Yeah, but, you know, I mean, Rome has kind of come to a belated uh, post-supersessionist understanding. Um, the question is, how deep, how thorough, how real is that? Um that will take too long to explain how it fits into their history of their theology. But what you're talking about in terms of Rome and the anti-Judaism, we might say, mm -hmm. of, of Rome, uh, of the Roman church, the, the Roman church is reflective of the tradition of anti-Judaic theology going back on the West to the, to the early days of uh, early history of Christianity. But you have to remember that that's also true of the East, the Eastern Orthodox churches and so on. Um, so just a quick, and we can follow this up next week, but it seems to have happened 
in certain Christian um, theologians and the way they were theologizing after the suppression of the Third Jewish War, the Bakaba Revolt in 135, uh, after that, you began to hear some Jew Christian writings here that uh, we're talking about. This is all what this indicates is that God has shifted in his direction and there's no place for Israel you know, in this plan. Not everybody said that, but some very influential people said that. And then there were reasons that were added in the fourth century and then it began to snowball. Um so it's a fascinating area in and of itself, but the question is, what is the scripture actually saying? And, and what I find remarkable is that, uh, you know, after Israel became a state in 1948, you did have these uh, New Testament scholars suddenly rediscovering Romans. Said, hey, you know, this is... Is actually there, you know, in the scripture, uh, and uh, that there's a future for Israel. And by about that time, the Roman church, the Catholic church, was allowing their biblical scholars to more freedom in studying the text instead of just saying what Thomas Aquinas said, but you know, so, um, and they began to, you know, talk about this too. So it's very interesting how, you know, that has developed. But the real issue for us is, what does the scripture say? And how do you understand this canonical narrative? And yes, Mark, what your point is that it is instructive to see, wow, how you can put an interpretation on this that actually obscures, you know, part of the text. And that can become tradition. Mm -hmm. And what do we do? We follow tradition, okay? Especially the Seventh Ecumenical Council in the eighth century that said, if you don't follow tradition, you're condemned forever. Really? <laughs> That's why we don't hold to the Seventh Ecumenical Council. But anyway, uh, you know, that kind of thinking has persisted. How powerful that is. So how important it is to be Bible-centered and come back to Scripture. Well, okay, so next week, questions like that, other questions that you have, I'm going to send all this out, so you look it over, and uh, we'll just we'll just go where you want to go, okay? All right? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the scripture that you give to teach us and guide us. But we see the awesome responsibility that there is to not only to receive humbly, and submissively your word and be instructed by it, but also the responsibility of, of teaching and, 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 and giving to others your word in a manner faithful to you and faithful to your scripture. Thank you for the plan and purpose of God that you have revealed in your word. Lord, we find that our hope is grounded like an anchor of the soul, in the atonement of Christ, in accordance with the, with the sure promise of the word of God. We pray that you would enrich us with a growing understanding of your word and that the joy of the Lord would be our strength as we walk with you, looking for your fulfillment of your plan and purpose and being a light in a world that appears to us to be growing increasingly dark. But you are the Lord, and you will accomplish your purpose, and you yet have your plan for bringing many to yourself. Please do this and grant us this blessing of seeing this even in our day, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.